This is the way Miracon looked when this was a cover. I don't know if I can put this up like, can you see? Yeah, this is, that's a little booklet that I wrote for my grandchildren. And, I, and uh, Chris ended up putting a couple copies in the library. I don't know how many of you actually saw it, but it was mostly pictures of Miracon. This is the way Miracon looked when dad bought it back in 1932. I'll just go through the building quick. This was the shed. They, in those days, this, this was built in 1783, and we think that this part was built nearby that time because they had to have kitchens and so on. Um, they had, the, the big kitchen was out be, a little bit behind this. This was the dining room. This was the boys' bedroom in our family, and the, up here were living room, parlor, two big bedrooms, and um, the attic. The, the strange thing about this is that they did the same thing that we did when we went up there every weekend during World War II. They closed off the summer kitchen and just used the winter kitchen, which was the dining room of the house. And what we never could figure out at first is why did they have a big sink with a pump in the dining room? Why did they have a cooking stove in the dining room? And they had the same thing again in the kitchen. And we find it didn't take long to figure it out. He did the same thing we did. They closed the kitchen off in the winter and the dining room between the winter kitchen because of not having to heat so much. So that was really two rooms in one. I just wanted to throw this one in because I didn't, it could go anywhere. This was a picture from the kitchen window of both the old Maricon, which you just looked at, and the new Maricon, which is coming up. We loved our Minadnock Mountain. We climbed it every year. And the pond is a story coming up but this is a picture, one of our beloved pictures that everybody had a copy of. This picture I'm showing because it shows the gardens and it shows the, the, the pond. When dad bought this, before he bought it, he and, and our family were up there visiting our grandparents and this parcel of land came for sale for 250 acres and it was this farm. It wasn't called Miracon then obviously, but, um, <clears throat> I guess dad must have done, mother must have done a lot of thinking because dad in the depression was a college professor at Syracuse University and they didn't fire their professors but they reduced their salaries and sometimes as much as 40%. So mother and dad were struggling to raise a family of six and then have the depression come. So when dad saw this parcel of land being for sold and these buildings and the barn and all the wonderful things that he would need, he just couldn't resist. And I don't know how in heaven's name he did it, but they bought it. And they bought Miracon and they already had a house in Syracuse. And I say, I, I still don't understand how he did it. But what he did was we had ways of making money at Miracon. I think this was his philosophy. He could uh, make enough money to make his salary and Miracon supply what the family needed. Some of those ways we made money in those days, the first, the biggest way in the thirties was raising potatoes. We sold bushels and bushels of bushels of potatoes. And that field, it was 10 acres, and about two thirds of that field was all put into potatoes every year during the 30s. Then we had the little garden for mother and later on for me to use for family. Uh, another way we earned wood was the boys cut wood. They cut down tr hardwood trees and then they dry for a year and then we, they cut them up and sell them as cordwood. And we had quite a few customers in Harrisville that bought hardwood from us. Another way they made money was, well, we didn't make much money off the sheep because it was wool and wool's relatively cheap, but we shared the sheep, 40 sheep every year the sheep got shared and uh, a man came and took the wool away. Um, the, the biggest income other than potatoes was blueberries. 
And Dad must have realized that blueberries was going to be one of his incomes because he had the 40 sheep for that reason. Sheep tend to nibble away and clear up all the brush and all the junk. And so the blueberry bushes and the blueberry, where the blueberry bushes were, were all nice and groomed, you might say. We could pick very easily. And we had those sheep. Those sheep were the last thing we got rid of in the, uh, well, I, I, my mind's an old mind, but anyways, it was the last things we got rid of. Um, so we, we made money on the potatoes and the pond, there was no pond there. I take the next picture, Gordon. This was the pond before dad and his older children and some men from here, from Nelson, helped him dig out this swamp area. There's the house, there's the potato field, and this was the pond. And we can go back to the new other picture, but this was dug up, dammed up, and this what it became was our pond. And it lasted um, till after, well, it lasted from the mid 50s. We kids were growing up in a way and dad couldn't, it didn't, wasn't able to keep it cleaned out with cattail, cattails and everything. In those days, the farms that didn't have water used wells. And throughout the blueberry pasture and the blueberry bush field and the, throughout the farm, there were wells. And they used that to water their livestock. The first livestock at Maricon Farm, it wasn't Maricon then, but back in the 1700s, there was a horse farm. And you can tell that by the barn, but they raised horses. And so they had to have wells in the fields and the horses got their water from the barrel filled up from the well. So dad didn't want to do that and he felt he didn't have to and he, he produced the pond instead. My favorite building on the farm was was the barn. I just love that barn. It was so big and so it's just I, I guess it was something in me that made me love it. But anyways these first these first six windows when I'm trying to point them I don't know if Gordon can see this he can do it but um, the first six windows we were horse stalls. We never used them as horse stalls. We never had horses because we had modern machinery, but we kept the horse cells and we stored leftover stuff in them. The next three windows were, it was a sheep pen and we kept the sheep there when they wanted to come in. The cows didn't really need to be inside except when they were being milked. So these two windows represent cow stanchions where we milked our cows. This was the truck. This was an area for extra machinery, like tractors and so on. And then this was the car. And after that was um, a tool shed on the end of the barn that went the whole width. These windows up above, the second floor windows were all hay mount. The farm prospered from 1932 on up until the late 30s, the farm began to prosper. We made, dad made much enough money to supplement his income and so in the 1938, we did two big things. He hired someone to build the barn and I doubt that any of you know, but the man's name that built it was, I said barn, I meant lab. He hired someone to build the lab and a man named Lounder built the lab. I don't remember where he lived, but he built that. And what dad wanted to do was to teach some courses up there and have the students earn their room and board by working on the farm because dad needed more help on the farm. So it was a win-win situation. It, was, it worked well for three years. The students paid Circus University for their tuition and they earned the room and board by working on the farm. Dad built two cabins and they were like this. Each carry had two beds in them and they were for student lodging. And one of those cabins late, later became an ice house down by the pond. But this one is still standing up near the what we call World of Red House, which we'll show in a minute. So that's the story of the lab. It only lasted three years when the war started. And after the war, it never came back. We never revived it. It was just uh, so that all that building and all so beautiful as it was, only, only was used three years. The little red house is, well, at the same time we had the, uh, the lab being built, Dad and the boys built this little red house. It's this little red bungalow. And he built it for caretakers. We were having, it was sort of a nuisance to keep the cattle and the sheep and have to have somebody come up all winter long while we were in Syracuse. So instead dad decided he'd, they'd build this 
and he hired a caretaker. And we hired Wilma and Charlie Ripley, and they were caretakers out in one of those big farms in Bennington, Vermont. But they were getting on in years, so they wanted a less rugged job. And they took the job at Maricon. And they took care of the cattle and the sheep, and they overlooked the farm in the wintertime when we were in Syracuse. So it all worked out well. And the little the other cabin is way back in here. You can see, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's back there. Now, this will come up later again, but this is where Dad, Bob, and I lived when we were building a new Maricon. And you can see the bricks and so on. This is just a general panorama. It's how you drive in the yard. Many of you probably been there. You drove in the yard and the lab was on the left. Then you drive way over here and the big brick build, brick house and, and sheds and so on were on the right. Across the field, way across the field was the little red house, the cabin, and on the end was the barn. So that's the way it was all laid out. And those are the only buildings we had at Americon. I wanted to talk about my grandparents because I don't know how many probably didn't know them, but you uh, know the area where they live. And they were such special people in our lives. Um, Alfred and Carrie Struthers. Grandpa was a minister, but not in the Nelson Church other than to substitute. But he was a minister. He built, he had this built in the 1900, the turn of the century. It was a great big old building and I'm showing it because it was located on the upper Nelson Road. The beautiful story about this building was this bedroom. It was made for the grandchildren, my, myself and my siblings. And we spent a lot of time there when we were young. And being the youngest, I probably spent the most time there because when the family went on trips, they left me with grandpa and grandma. These two windows faced Monadnock. This was the grandchildren's bedroom. And listen to see how big it was. It had two double beds, two single beds, a large, circular table which we did jigsaw on and grandpa and grandma put a stool around four stools around that table so we'd have a place to sit it was the most beautiful arrangement uh, these grandparents to me were very special and grandma often entertained out on this side of the porch which went three sides around the house because she could see monadnock but that bedroom grandpa and grandma called it their lamb's pasture and they would look at us and they would say, and this is our lambs faster and you are our lambs. And we used to get the biggest kick out of that when we were young and we pretend being lambs and all. But grandpa and grandma called it their lambs faster. So that's the story uh, up to that point. But it ends tragically, as most some of you may know. In 1947, the place burned down and they perished in the fire. And it was the most dramatic time of my life. That was in 1947, and I'm not going to take the time to go in too much of it, except that after it burned down and, and the grieving was uh, not completely over, but over enough, Dad, Dad and his three siblings decided to put some structure in its place. And so they chipped in and built what is now the building there. I guess that's all I have to say. It was sort of a memorial to Grandpa and Grandma and to that that spot. And this is a picture of the newspaper article we, we found when we came we came immediately to Nelson from near Syracuse when we heard the news. Well, you might be interested in that part of it. That morning, I answered the phone and Mildred Quigley was the one that was calling us. And she was town clerk at the time. And she lived where the, the library is now. And she's the one that told us about the fire and what happened. And then dad and I and Bob immediate left, immediately left for the cottage. This is a treasured one, it's a second treasured photo that we all saved and kept. This is my mother and my father, and this is grandpa and grandma. The cottage was across the road. Uh, I, this is probably all field now, but, but anyways, they, these four people were so important in our lives and they looked just exactly like this. This was the greatest picture because they that's the way they looked. Another photo that you might, some of you might have known my older siblings. Uh, this is grandma. Obviously, Ash Wednesday, and this was taken out in front of the cottage. And this is my sister Jane, my brother Park Jr., my brother John, and my brother Al. And I figured this picture was taken about 1928 because John was born in 27. So it's approximation, but uh, this is about, so Jane would have been about eight or nine years old when this was taken. This is a picture, and this, uh, this is sort of humorous because this was Grandpa and Grandma's first car. 
they were uh, at this time they were in their early 80s and um so that was their first car i don't know if there's a model t ford i don't know cars that well but that was there and this is mother and myself bob and park jr and we visited back and forth between the cottage and Maricon all the time. They would come up and visit us and grandma would bring pies or cookies or something. Then we would stop on our way to Keene to see them. And we were a very knit, closely knit family. And so the cottage and Maricon about two miles apart. So next, the next section is, is about the farm itself. We only had a working farm until 1941. And I'll get to that later, but uh, when we had a working farm, we had acres and acres of potatoes, and we had cows and sheep and blueberries, and it was uh, a busy place, and the whole family was working on it. This is Dad's first tractor. He had to walk it everywhere, and walking that big field back and back and forth, he finally decided he'd buy a better one. So anyways, he bought a tractor you sit down on, and it had a lot of mowing machine attachment. It had a saw rig attachment. He had a scoop. He had all the things Dad would need, and uh, he didn't have to walk anymore. You could sit. This is the truck, a 1935 Chevy. Um, he got it. It must have been one of the first things he got when they bought Miracon. It lasted until the estate sale in 1940, 19, um, It We don't remember having much trouble with the truck, but boy, did we use it. it. It was used so much carrying produce to Keene and carrying furniture back and forth to Syracuse. And it just was, it was a wonderful vehicle. And the that and the new track lasted until 1975 and they were, they were the workhorses of that farm. The Suburban was bought in 1941 after the war started. Now this is a sad decade for the Struthers family. It was a time when the Struthers family completely changed. The farm was no longer, became no longer a working farm. And the reason for that was that in 1941, my brothers decided to enjoy, join up in the army. Al joined the medical corps, Park Jr. joined the army and John joined the Air Force. And then to top it all off, poor mother, she just couldn't take this idea of her boys going to war and she was not 100% well. She had high blood pressure and terrible headaches. And so that summer after Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> she had a stroke and died. So everything changed in our family after that. It went from a family of eight down to a family of four and more often three, because Al was there, but he was in med school and he was too busy to join in on a lot of the activity. Jane was away and soon married. So we went from a family of eight to a family of three and Al, and the farm could no longer be a working farm. I often wonder how dad, be, he was so stoic about it, but how he stood it because all of a sudden that wonderful farm that was doing so well and he couldn't, he just couldn't keep it up anymore. So the Suburban became the new workhorse. And the first year after the war, we went to the farm every weekend during the winter because dad was afraid the government was gonna take it over. I don't know if dad was being overly paranoid or if it was really true, I, I don't know. My older siblings don't know either. Um, but anyways, he worried about it. And Bob, he and I went to that farm every weekend. We only missed two weekends because of st stormy weather. Thank God he didn't hold on to that fear. Um, it wasn't a, a working farm anymore, really, but we never went back the next winter. We just went to Christmas and that was all, which is to my brother Bob's and my delight. The Suburban was, it, it was like the truck. It just had so many jobs and it was such a useful vehicle. And it lasted until 1952. And when dad turned around and bought another one, but the second one didn't have to work as hard. Um, in those years after World War II, it was just Bob, Dad, and I. When we went to the farm, we did the haying. We kept five fields open. We didn't want trees crowding in. So we did the haying. Uh, we cleaned up all the room, the trees that the older boys had cut down. They hadn't been cut up yet and sold. And But after that, the farm became a summer home. We just went up there and mostly did our hobbies and our thing. And there was no actual farming going on. So 
1940s were a traumatic year for us, um, but we got through it. Uh, we didn't sell a lot of hay because hay wasn't really um, that profitable, but in the early days, in the 30s, when we were farming, we needed the hay to winter the cattle and sheep with. Um, but this is a typical picture of the chuck and load of hay getting ready to be sold. And we cut ice off that pond every year from 1932 to about 19, well, I, I don't know, about 19, the late 40s, perhaps. Um, so that was our refrigerator, and we did that every year. And this picture is, I thought maybe some of you would remember Bob. Bob was more social than the rest. He was more like his mother. The rest of us were all like dad, and we've tended to be sort of introverted. But Bob was always wanted to be out with the crowd, and um, I, he loved those square dances. And I expect some of you may know Bob, so I thought you might enjoy this picture of him back in the 40s, cutting wood with his father. Life changed completely, and after Grandpa and Grandma died, and that fire happened, Dad decided, and back in that we're back in 1947 now. Dad decided that he was going to rebuild that wooden structure that was connected to the big American building. So he tore down the old L, which remember was the shed and the kitchens that I talked about. And he tore that down and started to build what we, we call the new American. And this is the way it looked when it was finished. <clears throat> There's a picture of dad. He, dad did it all himself. It took him 15 years to build that building. And he was still teaching at Syracuse, so he did it weekends, not in the winter, but weekend, uh, summers and some weekends. He just, he lived there for 15 years. That was his life of building that new America. And this gives you a better idea of how big it really was. And you can see by working alone, it took him 15 years. Now, the rest of the family, we tended to help, but we were only up there when we could because we were all growing up and had our own jobs or schooling to do. And then one more picture I think we have of that era. Here's a picture of Al, Bob, and I helping dad when he dug out the cellar hole for the new Maricon. There's the tractor I was bragging about. Um, and there's the field that didn't have potatoes now because that was, that was only in the 30s, but that was the field. Dad worked on that building till 1962. He was 15 years building the new America. In 1962, that whole spring, he was doing trips back and forth, bringing the furniture up from the Syracuse home. He sold the home. And then in June of 1962, he moved into the new America, which the garage you see here. He had to have a place. One more thing about when he was building, he had to have a place to live. And he lived in the, the little red house. And that's where we lived when when the new Americana was being built. Uh, we had to sort of makeshift around, but that was the main structure we lived in. Well, one more thing about when dad moved it to the new Americana, that's, and you'll be interested in this, that's when he started writing the town history, the Nelson history. And he started in 1962 about, and then he published it in 1967. I remember Al and the, my kids and I went to picnic that year to the old home day and he was sitting there hanging out his his books in Nelson history but that's when he started build, uh, writing that you might know his other books some of his other books in 1950s he wrote two little books for the church to sell for money one was called tellable tales and the other was called the Nelson cookbook I think they might be in the library I'm not sure he liked to write he wrote all his textbooks for his students he loved to write and he had a flair for it I think he he liked writing now this next picture is of Maricon Gardens. Every Maricon, the old Maricon, the new Maricon, <clears throat> had a garden, a perennial garden. And even the new Maricon, after dad finished it, he put in this Maricon, he called it Maricon Gardens. And the reason I show it is the castor bean. It, the castor bean plant is over on the left, a spectacular looking plant. and. It sort of became a joke in the family because we didn't know it, but dad eventually told us, he said, well, you know that the castor bean seed is poisonous. And I, I always wanted one at Lindale Gardens, but I didn't dare put one in there because I was afraid someone might end up eating a castor bean seed. But it was a beautiful plant. If you want a beautiful plant, 
grow a castor bean, but be careful. Perennials seem to gr- be part of a Struthers genes. I think uh, my grandmother had perennial beds. I had perennial beds and dad had. We, we loved our perennials. And I think the reason we loved them so was because you could collect them and they went over and you could keep adding new species. And so it was co- another way of collecting things. Aunt Joyce collected elephants, but I collected perennials. So there you go. So dad lived in the new Miracon for about 15 years. And then it got, so we didn't think he should stay alone. So I took care of him in the summer of 74. And then that fall in November, he died. My sister took him to Ohio. He, she took care of him until November when he died. And then he, they brought him back and he was buried in the Nelson Cemetery. Mary Upton did the funeral. And then we had to think about getting rid of all the stuff at Miracon. So we had an estate sale and we had Andy Elder, he was an auctioneer, I don't know if you know him, but he was the auctioneer around town and he helped us. We, we had it on the 4th of July weekend in 1975. My brother Bob took charge of the barn, everything out of the barn. My brother Al took charge of all the other stuff that wasn't in the barn, but that we wanted to sell. And that was in the garage of the new Maricon. And I was sort of overseeing things. My sister took care of the library. Dad had lots of books, not just the ones he wrote, but he had lots of books. Jane took care of that. And the, the three days are wonderful. We had good weather and we had fun and we met to meet a lot of people and it was just wonderful. I imagine some of you were there. I think Frankie Upton bought the tractor, but I'm not sure. I'll ask you when we have our discussion time. Uh, he either bought the tractor or the truck or maybe both. So I'd be interested to know if you know who bought what at that estate sale. The next picture will be a picture I want only because it shows one of dad's talents that nobody ever knows about except our family. He built cages that were the most amazing cages I've ever seen. And I taught in many different schools. I just wish so much I could have brought some of those cages to my biology classroom. But this is a butterfly cage. I don't, I don't, there's got to be a better word than cage for these these pieces of furniture, but it was like a book. And the, oh, those those two brown pages were, were like a book page, and inside were, were butterflies. You can't see them because you're looking at the back of the page. There were the butterflies in the front of it. Then underneath were drawers, about seven pairs of drawers. You opened up and they were butterflies. This was a typical Park Struthers cage. It just, it It really was just wonderful. And he and mother evidently got excited about butterflies before we were born because he built this tremendous, they had built this tremendous collection. Even when we were young, if we took trips, dad would all say, don't forget the butterfly net. And he was still trying to add on to that collection. Over here is the gun cabinet. You can't see it, I don't think, but it had glass windows and it carried all the guns we owned. And that was another one. It wasn't a cage, obviously, but it was another piece of furniture that dad built. And in the lab, there were reptile cages, the amphibian cage, and I guess I guess it was the main ones. So orna, we, no, I don't think we had a bird house or anything like that. But the reptile cage was a, one of the interesting ones because it was about seven feet high and it had um, it had a tree. It was not living, but it looked like a tree. It acted like a tree. And the snakes used to climb, slither up and down that tree, and we used to love to watch them. And he had turtles running around the bottom, but that was the reptile cage. The amphibian cage was the same idea, six, seven feet tall. He had a pond, he had ferns and moss and amphibians all over the place. And I had that in the kitchen at Lindale until we finished remodeling Lindale. So I just wanted to show you, that the, he was so good at uh, carpentry and furniture building. The last thing I want to talk about in the last structure, we haven't really talked about that much, uh, the new Maricon. We were active during the new Maricon period. We had a lot of outings. John John, and Park uh, inherited the, the Maricon buildings and 13 acres of land to go with it. And Park Jr. wasn't as active up here, but John came up every summer. And in the early 80s, John had this new addition built onto the new Miracon. Now, the new Miracon didn't exactly look like a residential home. And we, my brother Bob, who had the great sense of humor, used to kid dad about it. He said, dad, it looks just like the so-and-so building on campus. 
And of course, the reason was that dad got all his education about building with cement, bricks and steel. He, in between classes, he'd go over and talk to these builders that were building new buildings on Syracuse campus. So Bobby kid him about that, but it did. It looked more like a university building of some kind. So Johnny added this to it and it, it was so pretty. It, uh, this was taken 10 years after my, uh, no, taken right after my husband died. I took a trip up there. We stayed with Dave Paddock. And I, I went to see this. Uh, the landscaping was not done. So it was, was, you know, it looked a little rough. But other than that, it was a great looking building, I thought. At least it didn't look like a campus building. Um, John kept it for about 10 years. And uh, he sold it to a Nelson residence who used it for rental property. And he kept it, well, he still owns it, but we're not sure why he had all the buildings torn down. So uh, Maricon itself lasted about 90 years. And then it, now it's, there's nothing there. You, I would be interested in it. I haven't wanted to go back. I haven't had the, I can't, I don't feel I should drive that far now at my age, but um, I, even if I go back for some reason, I don't know if I, I, I would go see it, I'm sure, but it would be hard. Um, so that is it. The last picture is the creator himself, the old man. <laughs> and this was taken after the new Maricon was built. And here's dad having one of our, out, at one of our outings. Um, this is before he had the, unless it was, I think this was, this must have been early on because it was before he had the perennial garden. Um, I would say he was in his early 70s, maybe here, maybe a little older. He lived to be 83. And he had hardy blood in him, but he didn't have the hardy longevity because most of uh, the hardies lived to be in their 90s. And some in their 90s, uh, some like Priscilla Waller is quite beyond 90. Um, so that's all I have. I hope it helps you understand Miracon, understand it wasn't a bomb shelter, um, understand why dad built it and uh, understand why his family loved it. So we needed so many ways to love it. And that's, that's my lecture for the day as dad would say.